This is the Rise Up Sea Red podcast, all about the Arizona Cardinals and the NFL, featuring insider and outsider perspectives. Enjoy the best hour of Cardinals talk on the web. Now here are your hosts, Jess Root and Seth Cox. Hello, Arizona Cardinals fans, and welcome to the latest edition of the Rise Up Sea Red podcast, the best of Cardinals talk on the web. And it's episode 406. This is Jess Root from CardsWire.com, the USA Today NFL Wire site. We have a special guest with us on episode 406, uh, entering free agency, uh, right tackle for the Arizona Cardinals for the last three years, entering his 12th NFL season is Kelvin Beecham. Um, he's been making the rounds. Um, he was on the radio on Wednesday uh, talking about a trip that he's taking. He's going to be heading out to Zambia to do some great work and he's calling for help from us the fans kelvin with through world vision you you yourself have funded a pair of clean water wells and you are you are now asking for a help from the community for a third tell us how how did you come across this particular cause because we know kelvin that you are all over the place when it comes to community work um you know the digital divide stem research reading you do so much work and 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 you know and if the fans have not heard this is that the nfl pa community mvp winner five times no one else is who no one else has been honored that many times that's it's impressive but aside from the the stuff that you've done on the field as a player for more than a decade what led you to particularly clean water wells in zambia in particular yeah, you know, the thing is I went to Honduras a couple of years ago um, just to go and see what our visions work uh, on a global global scale, on a global front. And, you know, was was convicted around just the conversation around water. You know, here in America, I've always talked about food insecurity and, and access to equitable, uh, equitable education, especially within the STEAM field. Um, so you can't really get to the conversation around hunger on a global scale because you are dealing with the conversation around water and access to clean water. So for me, before I can actually go and do the things I've done here domestically around hunger, I have to address the first problem, which is a basic human need, which is what so many people across the world struggle with. And specifically in there, in Zambia, they have 800 kids that are dying of uh, diarrhea and, and malnutrition just because of access to water. So not only wanted to talk about the, the problem, but how can I be a part of the solution? So... What what is so we've got you're heading out like you you went to the Suns game last night you have I believe yeah. it's your daughter's birthday tomorrow or or Saturday yeah. Yeah. it's not Saturday Saturday uh, the eleventh and then then you are off to Africa with the family yeah. um yeah, well just me, me and my wife all Leave right even at night yeah that's that's quite the trip and right there on the on the edge of free agency um. As I was looking at, because there's there's a place, there's a website through worldvisions.org uh, forward slash Beecham, right, isn't it? I, I think I accessed it through just last name Beecham. And just in the last 48 hours, the the amount that has been raised has doubled, almost doubled. And you are at uh, right now 80% of the goal of $15,000 to to raise for that clean water well. Um, what... What inspired you? For, so, you did the two on your own. What What is it this time? So, what's different this time about asking for the community help? Which is, by the way, a fantastic thing because a lot of us wouldn't know how to help with something like this unless we ran across it. And a lot of times, like TV ads or radio ads, we kind of ignore. But when some uh, an individual like yourself, a name we know who we've watched play football on the field. Um, what what was the difference this time of what just inspired you to say, hey, let's put this out public? Yeah, I think, you know, the ability to be able to, to garner the support from fans. You know, there's so many fans that tell me, hey, anytime you do something in the community, let me know. You know, if there's anything I can do to help, if I can ever volunteer, if I can ever give to the things that you're doing, let me know. So I just said, all right. They said, let, let them know. So this is, this is a, it's a good time to do it, you know. I um, mean, this has been the first time that I've really done like this matching. Uh, well, I've done matching grants before, but something to this this level, this significant. I've never done anything like this. So to be able to experiment and to be able to garner the support from fans. I signed a lot of autographs. 
So hopefully I've got a lot of tweets to, to help kind of push the message forward. So, you know, it's been reciprocal. When you get to, to the fans and, you know, we're paid to be entertainers, but when you take the time out to do things that are in the community that are affecting uh, families on, on a day-to-day basis and having, I call it that hand-to-hand combat, being right on boots on the ground and be able to serve, it, it comes back. And I've been blessed to, to, to work in the community for a long time. I've been blessed to be able to be a part of some, some great, things that have, that have happened in the community. And it's great that the community has came behind me and supported me in this particular fashion. With all the things that you've done off the field, how much of that uh, is you seeking out opportunities to do it? And how many times has it been where, where an organization or a group has come to you asking for your help? Because I mean, just from, from the cross, you've got the you know educa- education equity, um, you, you're campaigning for, for digital access to, to lower income communities recently, uh, getting minority youth to, to pursue STEM disciplines, uh, things like that, and in, adding to that the hunger and clean water access. How much of that do you do researching things that you're coming up with, things that you want to do that you do on your own? Uh, you know, the thing is, it sounds like a lot, but it's really just two verticals. And I put everything in the two buckets, try to keep it simple. I'm off into line. It's, it's, I use the KISS principle. Uh, keep it keep it simple, you know. So it's hunger, access to, to, to nutritious food, and science, technology, engineering, and math. And within hunger, you can't talk about hunger unless you have water. Here in America, we have water, so that's the easy thing. We go right to hunger. Domestically, I mean, you know, on the global scale, you know, it's just the conversation around water. But in those fields, people know that I that's where I sit, and I don't deviate. There's nothing against domestic violence. That's just not what I'm called to do. It's, it's nothing against, you know, um, you know, making sure that we're, we're saving endangered species or endangered animals. That's just not me. It's, you know, I have military people or uh, military uh, family members, but that's not, or, or veterans, but that's not where I want to serve at. Where I want to serve at is those particular lanes, and I stay in those lanes. So most of it is, is a combination of me reaching out and me finding natural synergies. Who do I actually want to work with? And who wants to work with me? So it's, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, the people who want to work with me and the, and the people that I want to work with. And we find a way to collaborate, you know. And then what's, what's great about it now is how do we do things together? How do, we, how do I pull people together? The thing about sports and sports brings people together at the end of the day. And if I can find an organization that wants to do X and another organization that want to do X, how do we do this together? You know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, I did something with United Aviate and Microsoft. United Aviators is trying to get more pilots and more African-American pilots into uh, the workforce. Microsoft wants to be able to educate more, you know, African-American folks in general. All right, well, how do we do something together where both parties get what they want? And what I get is the ability to just bring people together. Again, as an office of lineman, everything that we do is collaborative. So to be able to do that same thing within uh, the community is what I enjoy the most. Awesome. So, World Visions. I, I heard. I heard a little bit. Maybe the people who have listened also heard the, the interview that you had with Burns and Gambo yesterday on the radio here in Phoenix. But h- how did you come to World Visions in particular for this particular cause? Yeah. So I was actually at the NFLPA. This had to be 2014, 2015, and was talking about the work that I was already doing in the community. And I actually mentioned to this guy Dexter Santos. Um, who is who kind of works on the players' ink side, which is the business side, uh, the, 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 the profit generating side of the union, and just told him I wanted to do more globally. And he was like, Kelvin, here's an organization called World Vision. Here's, you should go spend some time with them. So me and my wife actually went down to Nashville. Uh, they've done a lot with kind of country singers down in Nashville. So we went down to Nashville and got some insight on, into what they did and, and what they did on the global scale. Uh, a couple years later, we went to Honduras. Uh, the pandemic happened in 2020. We were supposed to actually go uh, uh, to the continent. We didn't know where, but we were supposed to go to the continent um, in 2020, but things got derailed with COVID. Um, and now we're here in 2023, finally been able to go back again. So it's been a journey since, I would say, like 2014, 2015, and having a conversation with some of the executives over at the NFLPA. So Kelvin Beecham's cause that he's doing right now, he's headed to Zambia to, to, and, and needs our help. To, to fund that third clean water well. You can access that. You can help out by going to worldvision.org forward slash Beecham. If you can't remember that, you can go to kelvinbeecham.com. He's got a link there. You can go to his Twitter, Kelvin Beecham Jr. 
Uh, you can go to his Facebook, his Instagram, his LinkedIn. Search Kelvin Beecham Social something. You will find a link to that place, and you will find a link to be able to donate to the cause and get them there. They, as of as of Thursday afternoon, they are 80% of the goal. Coming up next on the Rise Up Sea Red podcast, the best of Cardinals talk on the web, we return and talk to Kelvin about free agency and the NFL. That's coming up next on Rise Up Sea Red. Now, Kelvin, can I ask you a little bit about some football, especially as you're hitting free agency? Go for it. Go for it. So, yeah, go for it. I know you, you probably answered a lot of these questions already. Um, free agency, you, you talked on the radio that you are kind of, it feels like you are – very open to what your next team is going to be. Free agency is a week away. You've done the work, and now you're waiting for the opportunity. Um, in terms of the Cardinals, do you? It, it sounds like that you're waiting to hit the market. Have there been talks of returning to Arizona for another season? We've been in conversation, um, but the thing is, is I'm, I'm not in. I'm not in the business of just playing one more year. And I still think that I have a lot of tread left on the tires. Um, And there's been conversations that have been had. I've talked with Monty. I've talked with JG. um, I've talked with the offensive line coach and the offensive line coach. And we already have some some commonality. Um, But I want to continue playing football. And it would be ideal to play here and to stay here. But, again, I also know the business. Um, You know, this is a new regime. This is uh, uh, new faces in the building. They want to be able to put their stamp of approval on things. I would love to be a part of the transition. But, if that's not the case, I completely understand. And there's no hard feelings. The relationships will still stay intact. I'll still be able to talk to everybody uh, within uh, the building, just like I've done with every other team that I've ever played for and played with. My, you've played the last three seasons, which I, I would think it would be fair to say you've been playing under market value for someone of your caliber of player and, and, and capability and status in the league. Um, it sounds like – so. M- when you hit free agency, if you have some priority, you talked about wanting to play in grass uh, on the radio. Yes, sir. It sounds like yes, you want sir. to play in grass. You want a ideally a multi-year deal and to show that a team values you financially more than just a year-to-year deal. That is ideal. That is ideal. Again, ideal. That's, that's idealistic. <laughs> What actually happens when you actually get a piece of paper and somebody starts negotiating, that's completely different. But ideally, you know, want to be able to play on grass, want to be able to continue playing for a substantial amount of years. And I'm going to continue to prove my love to the game. Uh, I love this game. I love everything that comes with it. And I love the process. And I think when you, you, you bundle those things together uh, that put you in, in a position to be successful, you know, not only at this age, but – successful in being able to teach the next generation how to do the same thing as well. Moving forward, are you, you're not quite at the point where you're thinking year to year. Do you have a do you have a, a goal in mind for how much longer you want to play? Uh, I mean, if I can play another four or five years, man, I feel confident that, that I've done enough for the National Football League and the National Football League has done enough for me. Uh, but until then, man, I have no uh, – there's no – there's not one fabric uh, of, 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 of energy, not one iota that wants to say I'm, I'm ready to retire or ready to, to shut it down. And my family knows that. My wife knows that. My kids know that. Um, and it's, it's, it's a great place to be in and you still love the game even at this age and, and, and even at this point in my career. You, when you came here, um, you said at one point that Coach Kugler was probably the only guy who could have convinced you to move from left tackle to right tackle. Um, as you move forward, do you see yourself more right tackle now, or would you like to go back to the left side? Man, you know, what's, what's interesting, and I ended up having to play left tackle against the San Francisco 49ers this year. And uh, it, it was crazy. It felt good. I'm like, I missed this. You know, you know how you, you haven't rode a bike in a long time, or you haven't been home in a long time. It just felt like old time. Um, but at the end of the day, man, you get in where you can, where you can fit in. And I, I've been blessed where I have the ability to play both. Um, and play both at a very high level. So if it's right tackle, it's right tackle. If it's left tackle, it's left tackle. Um, but for me, it's about being able to start, being able to contribute, um, and being able to find a way to win games and being a part of an organization that really wants to win games and is putting things in place to do so. Looking back on this last season, what what an interesting year, uh, to say the least. Yeah. Um, I know it, it, I don't want to deal with the detail, but how did it affect you in particular? You you had a relationship previously with Coach Kubler. 
um, which is one of the reasons why you ended up signing with the team. How was that as a player to have to adjust and to have that impact when he was dismissed late in the year without having – we don't want to deal, deal with the, 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 what happened, but how did that impact you in the room? It, it impacted me quite a bit, you know. Um, you always want to think of the best in folks, in which I, I still do. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that there hasn't been any video that's come about with what's been, you know, accused and, and what's been said. Um, and it's just it's just wild. Right before a game, you know, the guy who brought you here is asked to leave and you got to go play a football game on national television on Monday Night Football gets one of the best defenses in the league, man. It's just uh, it's just never easy. And, you know, you just – some of the stuff that happened this year, man, you just can't make it up, to be honest with you. <laughs> and we had just a lot of things that happened this year, where, well, last year, that uh, it just really made you scratch your head, man. I don't even think you could have took this script to, to, to Hollywood and, and they would have made a movie out of it. Because it just – it just seemed unreal, to be honest with you. Well, yeah, that whole year, only it, that's not that's not the type of movie you want to watch because that just got worse and worse and worse. It, it was like something every single month, starting with the playoff loss yeah. last year. From that to yeah. what was said yeah. about Kyler before the Super Bowl to yeah. to the suspension to everything. Is that kind yeah. of what happened it, with late in the year? Was it just too much to overcome? And then things just – it felt like you guys never could get – it was sliding, and you never could get tra- traction again. Well, we, we never could. To me, you know, I said this this morning on a radio show. We never could execute like we needed to. And you know, one of the, the you know, reporters was like, "Kelvin, you telling me this whole year is about execution?" I would say yes, because nobody cares what's happening out the field. Nobody cares what's happening with your family. Nobody cares about the suspensions, the injuries. What matters is how you execute between the lines. Now, did we have a lot of external things that happened and occurred? Without question. Did we have a lot of stuff? I mean, we had a we had a guy that, you know, passed away from a wreck that was yes. on, the, on the team briefly. We had, you know, the stuff that was going on with D-Hop. We had the, the, the way the playoffs ended. And, you know, I mean, it's just it, – it was it was a lot that happened in 2022 that had nothing to do with football. Uh, and yeah. when you got to the football field, we didn't execute like we needed to as a team. It's a team game. It's not a one-person thing. It ain't Kyler's fault. It ain't Cliff's fault. It ain't nobody's fault. It's the team. And when you think about the team as a team, we didn't execute like we needed to, when we needed to, to win the games we needed to. Have you ever been part of a, an offensive line that has been so hit by injuries? I mean, you were the only offensive starter to start every game. Um, yeah. Four out of the well, four out of the five starters ended up on your injured reserve. Um, that were originally there. Other guys ended up on injured reserve. Have you, have you ever been part of a line that was just so – they couldn't stay together. They, for whatever reason, bad luck, it just couldn't yeah. keep the same unit together. It's, it's, I don't know if it was to that extent, but I had a year in well, – was 2019, uh, my last year in New York. We were, we were beat up like that quite a bit, you know. Um, but not to this extent, you know, where even the guys were coming in and, and for depth getting hurt as well. Um, and that just happens. Sometimes you get the injury does, and it's just, it's just the nature of the game. But to, to answer your question, I, I've never been a part of anything like that, to be honest. You, you talked a little bit about the experience on Hard Knocks on the radio. I want to go a little different direction because I remember what you said before Hard Knocks happened, that you were not a particularly – you were on the record as saying you weren't <laughs> particularly a big fan of, yeah. of that happening. And then, what was yeah. it, the first episode? It was – all. Like, we got so much of of you on the field giving Leonard Floyd the business on the field and it, after the experience one are, are you that talkative with the opponents every game and two did you come away after the experience with the same op- uh, opinion as you did before that you weren't thrilled about it but what was your takeaway from it well to answer your question man I don't talk unless you want to talk if you want to go there <laughs> we can go there and, you know, the thing that I tell folks, that's, that's how I got paid. You know, I used to talk trash all the time. And when I was younger, that used to wait, I used to burn a lot of energy. I don't have that type of energy anymore. So I got to face myself <laughs> as it comes to talking. But if we want to get to that point where you want to trash talk and you want to do some things that are dirty and, 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 and not, you know, there's a way in which to play the game. This is a violent way. It's a violent game. Yes, absolutely. But there's also respect. And when you start doing stuff that's disrespectful, like, then we, then we we can go there, and I, I don't mind going back to that dark place. So um, <laughs> to answer that question, 
I don't mind going to that dark place when you want to take me there. Regarding my comments, man, the thing is, is it's, it's something about a locker room and an offensive line room that are just sacred. You know, uh, it's just things that happen in the building that that normal people wouldn't understand. People outside the building wouldn't understand the way in which we talk to each other, the way in which we talk, the way in which we joke, the way in which we, you know, push on one another, encourage one another. Like, that stuff is sacred. Those, those relationships and those bonds and those conversations, the conversations and laughs and jokes that we're going to have when we're 60 and 70 years old. You know? how, how many people have asked think, you about popcorn? <laughs> well, to be honest with you, let me plug this right now. Harkins reached out to me, and I've actually been trying to find a way to get to Harkins Theater. So if you can actually give me an uh, intro to, to somebody that, that, that runs corporate huh? there at Harkins, man, that would be awesome. <laughs> uh, but, uh, that, you know, a lot of people are actually one of the producers, <laughs> um, uh, Cortland, one of the producers for Hard Knocks, we were sitting down grabbing dinner, man, and he was like, man, I got to stop down and get you something. I got a present for you. <laughs> he shows over two bags of popcorn. <laughs> Is is uh, one thing that I thought was impressive is when when JG was introduced as head coach among the players that were there, you were there, a guy who's not under yeah. contract for twenty twenty three. Why was it important for you to be at that introductory press conference, even though you didn't know what your status of the future of the t- team is? Well, the thing is, I'm actually still employed until they stop paying me. I mean, yes, that, that's me true. Yet. You you so, are so te- technically, te- te- I, I, technically I, I, under contract till right. next week. <laughs> But the way that I think about it, man, it's all about relationships. You never know um, what opportunities present themselves when you're willing to meet people where they are. Um, I didn't know JG. I didn't know Monty. I didn't know the offensive line coach. Like I, I didn't, I, Mr. Adams, Coach Adams. Like, I didn't know any of them. But I'm willing to go and reach out and, and, and say hello, introduce myself. And I don't know what's going to happen. But who's to say five years down the road, I'm still playing and, 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 you know, somebody on that staff, I remember when Kelvin came up and, and met me at the press conference. Like, you just never know how first impressions and how far first impressions will go. Um, so I don't really put much stock into, you know, is that the right thing to do or wrong thing to do? It's, I feel that it's, it's about the relationship. And in the game of football, the world is very, very small, very small. So you just never know who's going to be coaching where, who's going to be the OC, who's going to be the offensive line coach, who's going to be the GM, who's going to be the – you know, the head of, of pro personnel, you never know. So it's, it's great to be nice to everybody and great to at least know uh, the people that are decision makers and the people that are, you know, controlling, you know, who gets on the field, who gets on the roster, uh, who has those, who has that decision-making power. And JG and Monty have decision-making power. Mr. Bidwell has decision-making power. Um, it's great to make sure that you have somewhat of a personal relationship with those folks. And again, I had that relationship with, at every organization that I've ever played at. Pittsburgh, Jacksonville, New York, and Arizona. And, and those relationships, you just never know where those relationships are going, where things end up. Coming up next on the Rise Up Sea Red podcast, the best hour of Cardinals talk on the web. One final s- slot with Kelvin Beach. I'm talking about two things. The young players on the offensive line and what he said about Kyler Murray on the radio. That's coming up next on Rise Up Sea Red. Two questions. One is about... Uh, The young guys in the offensive line room. I had the opportunity to talk to Lasitas Smith uh, a couple of weeks ago. There's some young guys, Josh Jones, Lasitas, Marquise Hayes, who we didn't hear from because he was on injured reserve. What what did you see from the young guys last year? I guess Josh is almost not a young guy anymore because he's hitting year four. Yeah, I can't call him a rookie anymore. I can't make him do things anymore. So he's not a young guy anymore. But, man, Josh is coming into his own. I think he did a a really good job playing left tackle for us, playing left tackle last year. Stepping in when DJ got hurt um, and being more consistent, which, you know, I think that was kind of the, the only thing that people wanted to see from Josh. He was physical. He played hard. He finished plays. And he got better throughout the year until he got hurt. Um, I thought uh, Leroy, that's what I called him, Leroy. Uh, <laughs> Leroy came in and played really well for us against uh, the, the Rams and kind of took a step back when we played, you know, San Fran. So it's like how do you find, to keep that momentum up and how do you find a way to be a pro every single day? finding ways to do and how can I be a pro every single day how am I putting the work in every single day how am I putting myself in the best position to be successful as a young player that's that's the focus is I just want to find a way to be successful put my name in the hat compete and be able to compete for a starting job in a roster spot um, and once I get that roster spot how do I keep it and once I get that starting job how do I keep it and that's the thing that I would encourage and I have encouraged 
you know, Lasita to do is like, you know, you had you had your shot. It ain't many, it ain't many six or seven round picks to get a shot. Once you get that shot, you got to make sure you take it, keep it, and do really well with it because you don't know when you get another one. Last one is about Kyler. Some comment that you know what you said. Um, yeah, we know how it's going to come across on the internet when when you say the quote. What does Kyler need to yeah. do to take the next step? Grow up, be a man, grow up. That comes across really harsh. Is it as was it intended as harsh as it was? Because one p- person can take it. Oh, Kyler is immature, or two, Kyler still has maturing to do, even though he's made progress. Well, what's what's interesting is you just see that headline um, of grow up, but nobody actually looks at the, the actual piece of what I said. I said it's not a completed process. Correct. I didn't did. say he lacks leadership. I said he just needs to grow up a little bit. I think he has the willingness, the ability, and the willingness to grow up. And if he does that, he will be just fine. They paid for a reason. All I'm asking and all I want to see is him lead more in every capacity. That whole quote isn't talked about. Everyone's just like, all right, he needs to grow up. Beecham said he needs to grow up. I, been, <laughs> I said he needed to mature last year. All like, <laughs> the, the, I said you you to, absolutely I said did, Officer Grace. I did, you know not? I said he's, I said he's maturing and he is starting to mature. This year, I said he needs to grow up. Meaning, <laughs> all I'm doing is using different language. He's maturing, he's maturing, <laughs> he's getting better. He needs to grow up. The same thing that you would say to your child. Hey, you're 10. Hey, you can't do the things that you were doing when you were 5. Hey, you're 15. Hey, you can't do the things that you were doing when you were 10. Hey, you're 18. Grow up. Like, <laughs> Absolutely. I, I completely agree with the notion. Um, we've, seen, we've seen great things from Kyler, uh, obviously. I know one thing that, that he struggles with is losing. And I know that's something that, as a, as a teammate, does. everyone does. Everybody does. And yeah. uh, he can obviously handle adversity better. And that maybe that's one thing that teammates would gravitate towards when they see him not down, but encouraging, which I've seen much more of him do in the last year than previous years. So I've seen growth. Um, but no, he's not a finished product. And obviously he's 25, he's 25 but, but, years old. How many kids, how many, how many players on the NFL are finished products at age 25 or I in life? Say, I'm not a finished product. <laughs> I, I, I would say I'm not a finished product. That's, and, and for me, that's what's mind boggling about how it's been taken. Like nobody's a finished product, but we've in society, we've become so sensitive to everything. Like if somebody says grow up, that means you need to do a better job or, that person needs to do a better job. And the thing is, I would want somebody to tell me that. Right. Somebody like, told me that. Kyler when I wants was 25. Kyler wants to win a Super Bowl. He hasn't done it yet. So obviously he still needs to improve everything that goes across like that. Hey, um, Beach, we are so I'm so thankful for the opportunity to speak with you on on, on about everything about this. Uh, we appreciate that you won that the 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 Pro Football Writers of America, our chapter here in Arizona, the good guy award. I hate the name of it. Uh, there's a bunch of good guys in that locker room, but for for the willingness to talk to guys like us, to talk about tough conversations and tough topics like this, and to do it with the candor with which you do it, we all appreciate it. Whether it's the day to day beat writers, I'm a I, I do this on the side and in the locker room during games. And so, Kelvin, I, I greatly appreciate the time and the and the honesty with which you you speak to everyone. Yes, sir. Anytime. Thanks so much. I really right. appreciate it. And then again, that's Kelvin Beecham. Go to worldvision.org forward slash Beecham. Help him build that third dig, that third uh, clean water well as he takes his trip to Zambia. Kelvin, thank you for your time. appreciate it so much. That wraps up this edition of the Rise of Singer podcast. That's been Kelvin Beecham. Again, go to kelvinbeecham.com. Go to worldvision.org forward slash Beecham. Donate to that cause as he heads out to Africa this weekend. Um, This show we dropped earlier than we anticipated uh, because of the time-sensitive nature of what Beecham's doing. Um, This would have been episode 407, and then the draft combine, our our combine show with Justin Higdon would have been 406. That will drop on Friday. So this on the show, I said episode 406 on the draft show, and this is 406 so don't don't mind that. It's all right. But I'm Jess Roop. This is the Rise Up Cigarette Podcast. We'll be back again with the Combine episode in a few days and talking free agency with Seth Cox next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the latest edition of the Rise Up Sea Red Podcast. Listen to previous episodes and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Audioboom, 
or many other podcast platforms so shows are delivered directly to your mobile device. Please give the show a five-star rating and always support the sponsors who support the show. We'll be back soon for the best hour of Cardinals talk on the web. Rise up Red Sea, be Red Sea Red, and of course, rise up Sea Red.